All right, we should probably start again. Right. Yeah. So the next speaker is Abhijit Majumdar, who will be talking about jets and event generation and A and at EIC. Ah, yes, and I should make it full screen. Okay. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> So I, 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 I'm guessing this might be the only talk on event generation. Uh, there was a discussion. Okay. In week four. Uh, so a lot of my talk is going to be focusing on event generation in AA. Uh, I don't know if you can see the pointer. And uh, there's be some whining at the end about what you need to do for EIC. And the whole idea of the talk is, is going to be trying to convince you that event generation is important, something you need to think hard about. And currently, there is, the situation is not uh, well developed or EIC. I don't know. Keep going. Sorry. Can I stop? Yeah, yeah no, I right. just kind of point you. So the event generation is, is, is not yet developed for EI for EA collisions or EIC and I'm using those words interchangeably. Uh, but I will try to show you what the situation is in AA, and you'll already see that things are are already quite complicated. Um, also, um, you know, I, I suspect, as I said, I suspect that this was probably one of the few talks on event generation. Uh, in this um, program, I'm going to show you how this how this works with a specific example. But I, I start with a theoretical calculation and slowly descend into phenomenology and into event generation. And then, of course, um, um, I spent a lot of time talking about results from the Jetscape collaboration, on which I'm a member of. Uh, it is a collaboration that basically designs event, elaborate event generator frameworks. And for that is, uh, you will see in a bit. And then, as I said, there'll be some whining at the end about what you need for EA generator. Okay, so let's really go back to, to the simplest thing that everybody, I think, is very familiar with, which is uh, simply looking at, say, a process such as E plus E minus goes to hadrons. Um, you want to calculate something like a fragmentation function at the platonic level, and you know you calculate an extra leading order correction to it, and of course it'd be a collinear divergence, and then some other with a log term, and that's what you really want to now resum, and that can be resum using standard DLAP uh, evolution equation over here, and uh, once you have written down a DLAP evolution equation, then you've proven factorization. And then you can you can then generalize from there to a pseudo cup form factor, which basically allows you to you know, um, mock up the, 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 the virtual correction in, in, in the big lab evolution. But that what that what that gives you really is a probability of no emissions between two scales, say the high scale and the lower scale. And once you have this set up, which basically just comes straight out of the big lab equation, um, you can then start to simulate by sampling this quantity, which is positive value. Um, and so that's what people do. And then you have your, your, your whole shower in, in, in a vacuum. Uh, notice uh, in this quantity, there is no concept of location. It's all about momentum scales. Okay, same here, we have this fractions of y. I'm assuming everybody's familiar with all of these equations, right? So, um, uh, it's, it's, it's all about momentum fraction. There is no real concept of duplication of any split. If you now want to take this event generator, if you just want to do PP collisions or E plus E minus, you know, you could just go and just to simulate that. Um, but if you now want to put it into a medium where the density of the medium changes from location to location, could influence the splitting probability, then you need to know where that split is. You need to put distance back into this or location back into this calculation. So you need a mechanism for, ge for generating. Is there a ruler I could use? Or, uh, yes, 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 yes. Close to the. 
Yeah, there are, there are small points. Yes. Oh, this one? Yes. Oh, but I still need the pointer, right? Can't change. Okay. Um, so you need a mechanism, and you need to have this mechanism set up in the vacuum itself. Because as you take this vacuum generator and slowly take it into the medium, some part of the vacuum generation will remain and slowly get morphed in, in, into a medium induced. Uh, event generator. And so, you know, you have to put this right into the vacuum at the beginning and then see it uh, evolve into the medium. And this is something that I uh, and a couple of other people did. Um, so my simulator is called the matter simulator, never matter, don't, doesn't matter what it stands for. <laughs> that just, that's, that's the matter simulator. <laughs> that doesn't matter simulator. Uh, um, I just want you to get the hang of the names. I'm going to flash a few more acronyms. And the reason is that at the end of the day, I'll, I'll, at the end of the talk, I'll start showing results of simulations compared to data. And there'll be a whole bunch of acronyms in those. So matter is taking DGLAB, a standard DGLAB based vacuum uh, uh, event generation, putting distance in con concepts into it, and then having a one, uh, uh, extending that to one interaction in the, in the medium. So how do you put distance in? Well, it's through an uncertainty analysis. Uh, all of you are familiar with this stuff, but let me just recap uh, from regular quantum mechanics. Imagine that the wave function uh, of, of a quark, let's say that starts out in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in some region. Uh, um, I'm gonna follow the regular DIS systematics where the quark is going in the negative direction, the minus direction, and say that the medium or proton is going in the plus direction. So there is a so Q minus Y plus, Y plus is the, is the plus location. So Q plus Y minus, and perp. Let's, let's ignore the perp for the moment. Just keep track. So what you want to know is that you know, so is the, the, the quark is going in the minus direction. You want to know the Y minus location. That's what you want to keep track. Okay, so you take this and you multiply with this complex conjugate. Again, drop the perps for a while. And then you notice the first thing is that the mean uh, so the, 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 the mean of the plus component, which is not the dominant component, is conjugate to the uncertainty in, in the y minus, and the uncertainty of the plus component is basically what's conjugate to the location. Okay, so this is this is like a Wigner uh, 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 transform kind of a formalism now, where you basically want to keep track of the q plus and the y minus, right? The other quantities are conjugates. So in the simplest DIS diagram, what we want to do is imagine that, so you have a, let's say you keep the photon momentum the same, you have a, a quark coming in, and then the radiation here at location Z, and the other one is in the location Z prime. And you now have a little bit of uncertainty in the, two, in the momenta that are coming in. Not, they're not exactly this, the, you know, the same. And then that uncertainty now becomes conjugate to the mean location and the, the, the mean momentum becomes a conjugate of the uncertainty in the location. Okay? So you basically introduce, usually in a regular DGLAM calculation, delta Q is zero, right? You know all the momenta exactly, right? So now we just introduce a little bit of uncertainty in the momentum to be able to get a distance uh, information. So what uncertainty should you put in? Well, whatever you put in, that should be less than the mean value of the momentum. And it should be such that once you're all set in whatever distribution you take, at the end of the day, it should recreate, it should uh, reinstate the fact that the mean formation time, that is the mean location at which the splitting happens, is given by the known expression, which is the energy of the QC, which you can get from regular uncertainty analysis, you can get from uh, next to leading order, uh, sorry, uh, first order perturbation theory. And so on. So this is the form. We take a Gaussian. This is the one that we use most of the time. We take a Gaussian form for the Q plus or delta Q plus distribution. With, with a with a now there's a funny looking width here. Uh, don't get too hung up on it. That width is basically set so that the mean location of the split comes out to be the, the, the same as the formation. So then what you get is you get a distribution of locations where the split can take place, and you basically sample that distribution. 
So very likely that there's a list could be here, then another list could be here, 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 and you go further and further away, um, the it gets less and less light. Right? I have a trivial question. Yes. Why not calculate this important space and see where the integrals really take their composition? Yes, because how would I, I need to simulate it. That's the reason. And I want to simulate it in a way where I don't disturb the standard D lab simulation. Okay. So what I do is I have my setup momentum space D lab equation. Yeah. And I'm putting on top an envelope of, of locations. I know what, exactly what you mean. I could just do this in quantum mechanics you know, thoroughly, right? Yeah. But I want to simulate this again and again and again. And I want to do it. I, I need to have positive definite ways. I cannot deal with interferences in a simulation, right? What Unless you're all model, yes. Yes, I'm, that's why I'm modeling this around this. I'm putting an envelope on top of the D lab. And so you kept your model in mean, your brother's this result of calculation of coordinate space in some sense, or you know, or you're not into that. I'm okay. just trying to understand what's going on. So I I can reproduce. So none of this affects the momentum space. Okay. So if you look at standard results that come out in momentum space, this is just setting locations of where the splits would happen. Yeah. Okay. So that does not change the the reason it's done this way is that in no way does it influence the large momentum components or the transverse momentum components. So entire D lab systematics remains untouched. All you get is locations of splits. Really no question. When I come to small labs, I know that splits are, I mean, are inside very narrow, very narrow area inside the pancake. Do you see from this point? I didn't understand your question. Say it. What, what is inside the pancake? Okay, in the glove, you have Jochen axis parameters. Right? Yes. It is known that if Jochen axis is small, all material dynamics, emissions of gluons are first in the tiny calculator. Mm -hmm. Do you see somehow in your model that your first job is Jochen axis material? So, you, this is, you would not see it here, you would see it here. You know. Well, after so you perform you mean this, right? You have after you perform some point of simulation, you could see this phenomenon, but not at this level. Yeah. This is done, designed explicitly not to disturb this equation. Okay, this equation is never disturbed. Okay, it remains as it is. We're just there's no information of distance in this equation. We're putting the information of distance sort of on top. That's so, right. so, so where your split lattice doesn't depend on the lattice of the split, so it doesn't depend on say emission angle. Exactly the way as it does in momentum space. Okay? The only hey, but, is, but say you take a splitting with other z 10 to the minus 5, right? Yes. This happens over the same time scale as z is 1 out. No, 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 so actually in week one and in week three, there was a discussion of Lindner functions. So people wish that the um, you know, distributions on the proton, right, that they're moving towards Lindner functions. Lindner functions, however, simply have positions and momentum, right? So it would be great to describe it as Lindner functions. To go from a Lindner function to, to a TMT or a fragmentation function, you have to integrate the coordinate space, right? So the coordinate space is integrated out. Mm -hmm. And now as I understand, you're trying to sort of Put it back, it back in, in without yeah. doing it really, without going back to Wigner functions and doing it yes. properly. Yeah. You're just trying to and I try to add on top of because I, I, yes. the first thing is I do, I cannot disturb this because there's a simulation routine for how this works right. because it's too much work to write the different simulations. <laughs> I don't mean the no, 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 no. So it's it's if, if by writing you mean coming up with a simulation routine, then yes. I look at distributions are not even positive. Yeah. That's the problem. Then That's the problem. The, this, uh, but this is factorized. So this is a factorized Wigner distribution, right? So I take the momentum part and that becomes this. And then there's a position part, right? Which is what I'm seeing. Right. Which, is, which is on top of this. Now whether you believe this factorization, right? Oh, you're assuming that this factor is that I didn't understand that. Yes. So I'm not sure how your row comes into the what row? Row. Uh, oh, this one. Row the down. density. Down. Yeah, yeah. Row. How does it come in? So I, I I so so from the big lab evolution equation. I know Q plus or the off shells. Which is C P plus or something. No, it's all in large component is minus. 
This is the Q square. So I'm doing a big lab simulation, okay? So I know the Q square at every split, right? I know the large energy component and I know the Q square. I know the large energy component, which is the minus, right? And I know the off shellness of the parton resistance. That I'm simulating by using regular Sudakov deep lab simulation. Once I have that, then I have a distribution of the uncertainty in Q plus. That gives me a distribution of locations where the split could have happened. Right, so Gaussian though is an advance. Yes, absolutely. Q plus, you're saying you can find from Q minus to Q squared. Yes, so Q squared is, is, yeah. is Q minus Q plus. Q corpus. Let's assume. Okay. So that is. Yes, so I know Q plus. Q plus. I know Q plus. I need, I, 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 I'm making an ansatz for delta Q plus and I'm dialing the width of the ansatz so that the mean formation time comes out to be energy over Q squared from whatever. The yeah, answer yeah. question is can you check that this ansatz maps on some of the understand that small x or just I'm not sure how. Which I need, mean, if, you, if you can, you have a clear result that I can, I can attach, I can calculate, I can do that. We have it's called big A equation. But he's starting from big love. How can you pretend to go to big A equation? Yes. He's starting from big love for the Right. Well, yeah. there's a double log regime, right? Where big love and BFKL yeah. overlap. Yeah. But I'm not That's sure. Really interesting. Interesting. Okay, now I think I see, I understand your question. You want to see if I can get the spatial distribution of splits that I would get. Right. So you know the, the spatial class. calculation of, in the dipole calculation of that. Right. So you know the Q plus is conjugate to X minus. Mm -hmm. And x minus, say, a quart is moving in the minus direction. Yes. Right? So, and, and so small x evolution can be put completely as a property of the quart wave function. Yes. With all these emissions. Yes. And small yes. x, we kind of know the ordering mm -hmm. in x minus. Mm -hmm. And then one could try to yeah. go from there and see if you get anything like a Gaussian, which would be a bit, I think it's a long shot to get the Gaussian. I yeah, okay. Like I'm things. not, okay, so I tried a couple of different things. Okay, but the question is how sensitive are you to the choice of the Gaussian? The Gaussian is the easiest thing to right? Okay, uh, the, the, you could try something else. The thing is that you're always dialing the width so that the mean formation time comes out to this. Okay, and I think this is also something that comes out of the energy. If I know the energy and I know the option that's the part of that's the formation time of the yeah, that, period. Right? Okay. So this is designed to reproduce that. You dial the width every time. Now, there's a distribution around the width. Okay, I don't know what constraints are that. So, there is where I assume the culture. Okay? <laughs> okay. Um, so, now you have some concept of distance, and now you want to go put it into a, a, a medium. Okay? And you, you are looking at multiple scattering of this parton. Um, I wanted to say I'm only describing part of the formalism, and this is going to get more and more complicated as we go on. I was assuming Al and Edwin would be here, so I'm not describing their part of the formalism. So I'm just going to work on my end of it. Um, so you have a you have a quark which has a large Q minus, as I said, it has some transverse momentum, which um, if you follow this soft collinear effective theory. Kind of part counting arguments is usually denoted by the scale lambda. Lambda is something much smaller than one. You should maybe say lambda q is still much larger than lambda q city. And you have some off shellness, which is given by lambda squared. Okay, this now is now going through the medium and it's going to have multiple scatterings. This is the amplitude side, this is the conjugate side. And the momentum of the objects that it scatters off have a transverse momentum, also of the same order as a transverse momentum. Of the probe, and this is simply like, like thinking of it as a dipole approach. The size of your dipole is roughly uh, one over the, the transverse momentum. So that's the kind of thing that you're scattering off. Usually, these are called Glauber gluons. So you resum all of this, and you now consider the case of emitting a gluon that now has multiple scatterings. This blob is the same as this blob, it's just put over there. To make uh, the drawing easier, and all this is now deep all set up in the formalism of deep elastic scattering on a large nucleus. Uh, 
So I'm going to start with the part where the virtuality of the original of the parton or the quark that goes in is still large. Okay, I'm, I'm assuming that this q squared this is really easy to find. Right? So, <laughs> only I could get away from yes. So q squared or offshellness is still much larger than what is the saturation scale of the medium which is roughly q hat times tau. Tau, again, is the formation time of any given parton in that shot. OK? While q squared is of the order of L curve squared is of the order of the kk is the, is the momentum that you're exchanging with the medium, at this stage, you have lots and lots and lots of emissions, right? So they're coming out of the vacuum shower. And you have rare scatterings, which means that the, even though k perp is of the order of L, the expectation of k perp squared is much smaller than the other Okay, or it's much smaller than q squared. You don't understand what that means. That means so it's the is k perp of, of the order of l perp or not? k perp is of the order of l perp. And so k perp is, is what? k perp is, is, the, is the momentum of a given gluon that you exchange with the medium. Coulomb. 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 The exchange with the medium. And l perp is the momentum of the radiated gluon. So in coordinate space, everything happens at the same transverse same impact parameter. Yes. yes, yes, you can, you can assume that. Same impact parameter. Yes. But then why do you say that the book curve squared is much larger than the typical K curve squared? So this is the expected K curve that I build up over some length. Right, so that's Q S squared. Yes. Right, <coughs> right. That's exactly right. But what that means is most of the time you don't have much of that of scattering. You only have rare scatterings. So even though in each scattering you are exchanging L per or of the order of the dipole size momentum, heat size momentum. Right? If I just ask over a certain length L, how much do I get per unit length? That is very small. You take the K per, you integrate over some length, divide by the length, that's going to get smaller. The saturation scale is still smaller than the size of of, of. so so basically you are now choosing to look at the early choosing to look at a new yes. emission yes. that transfer form might be much larger than the saturation scale. Yes. Yes. So yeah, yes. somehow saturation scale is fixed, but you are choosing to look at yes. transfer more yes. new emission with large brackets. So I'm saying that you start where the the, 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 the typical virtuality is much larger than the saturation scale. And then the first several emissions will be much, will be have scales larger than saturation scale, and we come down to saturation scale. Okay. So this regime, where, where you can say things like this, is the higher twist regime. regime. Uh, and just to give you an idea of what the results look like, um, if you consider it. Um, just look at one emission of a gluon from a quark. Um, I am going to uncouple some of the integrations that we what one does. So L perp again is the is the is the transverse momentum of the gluon. Let's say L q perp is the transverse momentum of the quark. So the gluon takes y times the original quark's momentums, and the, the quark then takes one minus y times that. Okay, both of these are put on shell. And so now I have a delta squared of L q perp and a delta function that basically says that those two transverse to be equal and opposite to each other. All of you know that there is a 1 over L curve square in, in the standard emission spectrum. I'm just going to write it as L curve of L curve square and dot with L curve of L curve square. I think I'll get a lamp to do this function. Okay, the reason for doing that is because when I do this, what you get is you look at the total transverse momentum of the, of the dipole. And it's, it's has, it gets kicks from all of the different scatterings. And then there is the L part of the gluon, which you should think of as the, as the thing that, that, that separates the quark and the gluon. And that gets some scatterings here. This side is the amplitude, and this side is the complex conjugate. Okay, and each of these have k perps in it. Each k perp, as I said, is of the order of L part, but then they are multiplied by the probability of getting that kind of a k perp exchange. And that's what really makes it smaller, right? This probability is kind of small in the regime where the transverse momentum is much larger than the expectation. 
So making that approximation, I can then expand in uh, L perp, sorry, K perp expectation over L perp squared. Sorry, these brackets should really be angular brackets. So you get this expression and you get an, uh, uh, an interesting looking phase factors that you have here. And what these phase factors tell you basically is that it could be when you have an emission like this, it could be that this quark is time like uh, off shell because of this scattering and then radiates uh, a near on shell blue on a quark, or it came in light like and then it radiated a space like blue one that underwent a scattering. And then these two guys are again on shell, or you radiate the blue one and the quark became space like. And then these two are on shell again. And all of these will interfere with each other. Okay. And if you, if you, you, you can reduce this back to the old, I don't know if anybody's familiar with this, the Wu and Wang calculation, where they only took one scattering. Uh, uh, and so the, the, the connection now between twist and scattering sort of becomes quite clear that, that next to leading twist or next to leading par correction basically gives you one scattering per inch. And that is now what you want to repeat. Okay, you want to have several of these. You're still in vacuum systematics. You're still assuming that uh, Q squared should be Q squared is much larger than the saturation scale. And so you still have uh, virtuality ordered or angular ordered uh, uh, emissions with, with, with the occasional scattering. So, sorry, I missed. Could you go back to the first on the corner side? Yeah. So, I mean, at small x, we would normally do it in terms of coordinate space. Yeah. So your so your rectangle in the middle would be just a wave function in the constant. Yeah. And then everything else. Well, at least in the small x regime, you can just write loops and lines, which would incorporate all the ultimate exchanges. Mm -hmm. and so you would you wouldn't have to. I mean, if you want, then you can expand them probably the one and then put square. Mm -hmm. In principle, you have an all, all other expression. I mean, that's what you have here as well, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I, I'll, I'll get to your, okay. I mean, so we will have both of those, okay? We will have the case where um, you have the L curve much larger than the mean, than the saturation scale. You'll have the case where L curve is order of the saturation scale as well. And there'll be, then there's a whole question of how do you merge these two. So this is what I meant by, you know, I start theoretically, but I'm going to slowly wander into phenomenology and in this formula, you are assuming a No, not here. Not here. No, not here. This is complete. Okay. Right? Here I start. Yeah. So I basically take this, expand it out, looks like that. Right. Yeah. Expansion around my canal will be the initial In coordinate space. In coordinate space. It's a size of dipoles, I think. It's just, your, your y is not small, right? My y is not small. y is a fraction of the quark momentum carried by the quark or the gluon. Gluon, gluon. Doesn't matter, right? Yeah. As long as it's not it's small. Not it's small. I'm asking for transverse. So yeah, yeah. So it's the it's the expansion in the limit where the emitted gluon has a large transverse moment. So in coordinate space, it means that you're emitting the gluon is emitted close to the quark. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like closer um, than closer than one over the saturation. So you're saying it's like positions of the. It's not my no, order. It's, order. it's, it's, the, view on it's, it's are, the opposite because it's, it's really it's a hard, hard emission. With the blue one, it's emitted with the no, but what, is, what you just said, right? So the L curve is a relative momentum between a quark and a blue one in yeah. the final state. So they're in mm -hmm. the position space of closed. Yes, yes. Yeah. And they probably are at the same position of the incoming quark. Yes. yes, that's correct. So then it's probably I can now. But the uh, what do you mean by I canal? Yes, well, what I mean by I canal is <laughs> <laughs> since since I'm sharing my fiat, <laughs> I can put in. So normally I would say for non-zero y you would have non I canal, right? This is some X curve, this is some I don't know, y is already used and then Z one, Z mu one, Z quark, right? And and they're all related to each other. This is y, right? This is one minus y, and then X curve is what is it? Y uh, z u plus one minus y z quark, right? So that it's small y, for instance, if it's a soft blue one, and the position of the incoming quark and the outbound quark 
are the same. Now you Thomas. So what, so what what do you mean by iconal? What is the iconal you mean specifically? Why is it y equals zero? Yeah, y goes to zero, y so, goes to one. Yes, yeah, so here, here he's not taking the limit y goes to zero. He has a finite. Yes. The y is yes, finite. Yes, that's what I said. But the part, uh, but fi y is finite, but the, but the coordinates of the blue one and the quark in the final state are close to each other compared yes. to one over the saturations. Right. And yes. if they're close to each other, then they're approximately equal. So yes, so also some, in some sense. Yes. Yeah. Can I go on? <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> <laughs> what would Mervyn <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I, this is, the, this is the, the reason you come to IMP. Like, I, I love having this, this, this discussion. Okay, so we have now only a, if you retain the first correction. Now, if, if you're really in this limit where Q squared or L prop squared is much larger than the saturation scale, then you can go back and you can derive an evolution equation which has the splitting function that you had before, and you have this extra term which has this q hat you know, over, over L prop squared and then times the length and times those phase factors that I said. So all of this really does is it, it, it you know it, this this integral of course is cut off at the formation time uh, uh, by by our uncertainty analysis that I said. And so if you not only, if you take this integral up to the formation time and then try to resum this, what will happen is if you go back to the standard fragmentation function, you have your usual terms that you have from the vacuum analysis, and then you have a term that is q hat times some number. Okay. And so this is what, if you resum this into the fragmentation function, you get a medium modified fragmentation function. That's what it means. Okay, so there's a bit of the medium a small correction that has now been resummed into the fragmentation function. Once you have a deglab formalism, of course, you can immediately go to the pseudo okay, and start simulating jets in the medium. So, sorry, I just for asking so many questions. What, yeah. what, what are you resigning? There's multiple emissions. Yes. Mm -hmm. with, the, with, the, with the, uh, the rare scattering, so there, there could be a scattering, they could be, be vacuum like, right. or nice. they could have a scattering. So this is just the first correction. Yes. Right, so yes. That's exactly. It. It's just the first correction. And what? So the pound should have dimensions for the same dimension. Yes. yes. What's what's that dimension? Oh, uh, it would be the integral of this quantity, right? That brings it back to one. So if there's a one over L prop squared, actually, I should say, and then there is a length. So it's q hat length over L prop squared, or over q squared. But then we don't have, uh, so when you say you, you have d lap, it's d lap in the modes of what? The modes of L prop squared, right? Yes. So this is not. This is a twist correction. Right, so it's not really d lap. It's not really d lap. It's not really twist either. No, that's right. It's, it's d lap with one correction, one, one length correction. That's it. Right, well, that's a whole separate discussion we may have. I would write you know, you have a higher, this operator, you write a separate evolution function that can be tried to put it all into one equation. Where is the higher twist operator that we're talking about? This is, this is only when it, 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 the fragmentation function has not changed. That is still the same thing, right? You just added an operator, an extra operator in the evolution equation for the fragmentation. So that's like operator mixing. Right. Oh, so, so usually the the, the D lab fragmentation function when you when you when you when you evolve it only mixes with itself, right? Yeah. So now you have it mixing with one other operator. Of so what's different twist? Huh? Of different twist. Of 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 different twist. Yeah. Of no, twist? No, of twist two. Then you should also log it. I'm not following. There's no dynamics. I mean, the statement is that it's not going to be a little or even subleading lower summation. A deep lap is the summation of all the yes. organization scale. Mm -hmm. um, the correction you're including this Q hat bound term is not of that type because it has one. No, I know. Curve square. But I have other, I, I, could, I could absorb other constants along with my. 
but it's not a constant. It depends on, on the Q squared. Square. Not a lot. It depends on our curve square, right? Yes. Q, Q square. Yes. So in a non logarithmic way. So yes. Therefore, it's not an R3. Non logarithmic correction. Yes. And so, so the standard procedure is if you have, uh, and we have discussions about it at a higher state, I remember. If you have, you know, operators of medium twist and higher twist, if you're writing low Q squared type of D-lock equations, then they don't mix. So if you think this lock, uh, operator has got its own equation, the higher twist equation, uh, operator has got its own D-lock equation. For, for if you're looking at structure functions, yes. If you're looking at the effect of the structure of the object on the fragmentation function, then you can use it. This is not like I'm not mixing a fragmentation function, twist to fragmentation with a twist for fragmentation function. I'm mm -hmm. not doing that. No. No. This is a so what is the point to the debug equation you're speaking for? For the fragmentation function. Yes, so if you write the definition. Can you raise uh uh just a bit? <laughs> so it is minus <coughs> you're not gonna get me to write in the correct order. No 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 I didn't mean what what is the better Sorry, it's that's supposed to happen. <laughs> it's like the highest saying this is immense. It's supposed to happen. It happens every week a few times until people get used to it. And there's probably a one over two G plus. Over two <laughs> so this is your fragmentation. And I wanted to see how. So then, when I when I calculate this at at, at next to leading order, and next so next leading order, I'm including diagrams like that, right? And now I'm also including diagrams like this. Okay. So this, of course, gives me this stuff up here up to this point. And so, some other so in some sense, when you're calculating things like this, you're not calculating vacuum expectation value, or somehow there's, 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 a, there's a medium. You can say that. You can say that. Yeah. So, so there's a medium. So probably the operator definition as as hadronic state fermion operator and vacuum is not anymore. It's not the same so, object. So you can you can see it this way. Okay. So, 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 vacuum. so 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 there's a medium. So you can you can see it this way. That okay. So there's some emission. And then there is a fragmentation function, right? And you can so we're assuming this is a strong assumption that the medium ends here and then it goes out and fragments, right? So it is a change in the y distribution that's the change of the fragmentation function because of emissions like this and because of emissions stimulated by scanning. Yeah, but if, if you're lumping in the, the effect of the medium with the fragmentation function that describes this, uh, mm -hmm. this fragmentation, then you're not factorizing. Interaction with the medium and then and then hadronization and then fragmentation. But you are it's only the same. Yeah, so effectively, like Thomas said, the operator changes, right? Instead of vacuum space, you have some sort of a medium space. Why you change the operator? Yeah. Oh, external field. Yeah. No, but external field. We change the operator. Well, we use no, the, the, the state. The, but the, the, the state, state, the state. No, but it's it not a vacuum anymore. It's yes. a state with an external. But it's, right. this is in the assumption that you can separate the check from the the dependent the medium. Okay, so there's a medium portion and then there's a check. But I think you're trying to absorb the medium portion into your equation. Not the entire medium portion. Okay, just the oh. part that affects the shell. Well, let's put it this way. Where in the definition of this operator is that little block that gives the view on uh, the T channel view on the PM view on the road in the diagram on the right? Um, so, 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 so that's that, that's right. It's in the evolution. Right? When I yeah, start looking at yeah, if, if I look at it, you have an equation for D. Yes. 
which, involves, that, yes. which involves things like the fermion operator psi, right. the vacuum state zero and B, and the hadronic state mm -hmm. A, H. Which one of these is it that knows about the existence of a medium? So eventually it will have to come in here, right? So no. there has to be. Why? Because X is everything else you create. You start with a vacuum. Yes. You, you, you have a work. Yes. You have created out of the vacuum by your side field. Right. And then that work fragments into H and everything else, which is X. Mm -hmm. So X is not the medium which is just the diagram. Yes. Instead yes. so of zero, you should have a medium. Yeah. Right. Very good. Right. And then I should say that what I'm saying is that the medium, we'll talk about this in a while, that I'm now separating the effect of the medium only on the part of the shunt. So basically, he's taking the vacuum uh, fragmentation function and he's trying to adapt it to, to in the case you, you are the MD. Yes. Yes. That's yes. so it's the splitting function. Yes. Well, which is what it is. P but, times that. But, but the exactly question what is that the new term is not logarithmic. Yes. You see, yeah. so, so it's not really the club in the standard. It's not exactly the standard. Maybe sense. with this multiplication of the operator, it's a case uh, because maybe it's not. Please. Can you think about the medium like some um, the ground field? Yes, yeah, 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 exactly what I'm doing. Yeah, I'm thinking of the medium as a background field. Yes. In fact, if you look at this expression, that's exactly what that looks like. Right? You have a bunch of background fields that you're scattering on. I mean, I think no one has any problem with this expression. It's just when you try to interpret, when you try to put it into deep block framework, mm -hmm. like it. because I get more it's similar. It's similar, but I have some issues with. So the problem with that, I'll, let's let's ask you this question again. But so, I so basically, if I like to formally want to derive the B lab equation, mm -hmm. what I take is that I take the lowest line. Yes, and then I then I differentiate with. With respect to mu squared, yes, then I get the log of the derivative with respect to log mu squared, yeah, which is equal to the coefficient of the yes. log. So oh, now the q hat or the addition of q hat part does that know about mu squared? Yes, so it does. So there's a well, uh, you so this one over q squared, not one over two squared. Let's not get hung up on that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> <details>. so, <laughs> <laughs> um, so you, I think you, what you do is you, you get the fragmentation function at the scale of q squared. You set mu squared equal to q squared, right? And, and you first you differentiate right. with respect to mu squared right. to get the evolution yeah. equation. Yes. Then you choose mu squared to equal to the q squared. squared. Yes. But, so it's, but, but it's, in, it's in that or you don't differentiate with respect to q squared. You differentiate with respect to mu squared. That's what gives you the evolution equation. Only at the end then you choose mu squared equal to q squared. Yeah, and the mu squared dependence is actually from just free normalization. That's just from free normalization. Yeah. 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 yeah, but at so the end, you can, you can, you can show this. It's the same as differentiating with mu squared. Right? It's I a lot. At, it is, yes. unless, it is at least with, with, without the q hat part. Yeah. But now right. you add this q hat part, which yes. I presume depends on q squared. Yes. But not on, but it, but not on mu squared, or does yes. it? Uh, it? So if you don't have, have, if you, so it, it depends on the q squared is the same as mu squared is as long as q squared and mu squared only appear always together in the combination log q squared or mu squared, then it doesn't matter. Or in the ratio of the squared. Okay, so yeah. could, you, could you write but, the bound explicit here? I mean, we're oh, discussing I, the part I, of the formula. Yeah. Is <laughs> Very fiercely. <laughs> yes, I don't remember off the top of my head now. But does it have any mu squared dependence? That's what the one says. It does. Okay, it's just coming from this uh, multiple stack. Okay. Right, it should, yeah. right? Because yeah. mu squared is just, just a vacuum. Oh. Yeah. So the mu squared is just a, is the dim reg scale. MS by the MS by So, uh, yeah, I think Thomas has a, Thomas has a, Thomas has a valid point. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, why don't we yeah. interest in lunch? Yeah. <laughs> right, so by the way, we have uh, no discussion scheduled by our conveners today, but if people are interested and want to give a digit more hard time, <laughs> <laughs> we can get together with a good kids.
Um, what's the plan? Is there a discussion? That's the plan. Yeah, so it, it's, you know, whatever people want to do. But I think just reminding that in principle, we don't have the rule that comes back. No, no, no. Yeah, discussion. And so it's well, it's well, it's well, it's well. have the other room reserved. So there's a room behind this one. For sure, we have staff. Yeah, sure, sure, make sure that. No, it is, it is. But I'm saying this one in half an hour, in principle, if someone comes in. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's going to be Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is going to be until 12.30, but, you know. Just friendly reminder. Maybe nobody will come. Yeah, so I, I want to take some exception to what you're saying, because I think what you could set here is, once you set mu squared equal to q squared, right, you basically get your fragmentation function at the scale of this, right? As long as you have a mu squared in there, you have this large extra correction. Right? And then if I want to see if I renormalize this expression at the scale mu squared or at some other scale, how does it change, right? That's basically what you're trying to do with, with eta. Right? Yeah, so I need to at this point or I normalize at the next point? Yeah, so I need in both sense. Yeah, so, so you renormalize it at a different point. So you, so you have a, so you have your fragmentation function depends on the factorization scale mu squared. Yes. And then what the Diglatt equation tells you how it depends on that scale. Yes. Okay. And so it's only afterwards when you put mu squared, I mean, then, you, so you have a fragmentation that function that depends on some scale mu squared, mm -hmm. and then you decide to evaluate this at the, at the scale mu squared equal to mu squared. But at, at that, this point, you have already derived the Diglatt equation. Yeah. yeah but, 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 but now if I have a correction to it, Right? Then as I set mu squared equal to q squared, I see that my fragmentation function at the scale q squared has an extra term. I think you have to push that correction term inside. It's outside. Because when you take the differentiation with respect to mu, it does not depend on mu. Your, your differential equation did not change, your physics did not change, you get the same evolution equation, and your whole it's job right. is gone. So you have to put outside in here as a correction to on top of yeah, it. So in some sense, so in some sense the Q hat term, if you example what Kirill Giovanni is saying, I think, is that if the Q hat term would not be a term in the in the Diglab equation mm -hmm. for the fragmentation function, but just a separate term, yeah, so yeah. that you have a fragmentation function which satisfies vacuum Diglab and then plus the Q hat correction. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Because again, the Q hat term, I mean, the graph only knows two things mu and factorization, mu f. Yes. There's no Q there. So if this Q hat term is just a function of Q, not the factorization scale. You just put no, outside the scale. Yeah, right. Right. So how do you know that the scale is? You should have mu f in that equation. Then you're setting yes. mu f equal to Q. Yes. But uh, in then, Q hat, you yes. don't have mu f, you have Q. So yes. That's the issue. Yes. So yeah, that's why you should be out of the bracket. No, but if I change, bracket. wait a second. If I if I change q squared, right? If I now go from q squared, if if it, if this wasn't q squared, if I do it plus q squared plus delta x, okay, okay, and I want to now find the fragmentation function. Are you saying that plus also q x will change? Yes. How? Oh, because that but has how? that has q squared in it. But how? You don't know. No, but does it have q squared or q mu f? Q squared. Has so q that's squared. The issue. No, no, but if I change q squared. Let me ask this question. Okay, so I have a fragmentation function at the scale mu squared. Okay, and I, I and I get to that by setting mu squared equal to q squared. I have now defined my fragmentation function at the scale q squared. Okay, now I go to q squared plus delta q squared. That, that, that's fine, but well, no, no, wait, let, me, let me finish my sentence. Okay, so now I would say I change mu squared to q squared plus delta q squared. That just sets the vacuum part up, right? But this term also changes. Oh, if it doesn't depend on it q squared. It depends on q squared, because q squared has changed. You could evolve this by running up, <coughs> by taking derivatives of mu, you can also run with derivatives of q, right? And then to make formalism correct, you should add by hand a log of q squared over mu squared, so that when you have a differential equation, it gets into as a correction. Otherwise, it is it's wiped out as correction. As it's standard, it looks like uh, it's like a log of four pi. It's there or it's not there. It doesn't matter. In that well, it's it's there if you absorb it. Then it has a. It depends on the q squared of the equation, right? That's the problem. It should depend on on, q, on log of q squared or mu. Why log? 
Why? Because otherwise, if you, when you take the differentiation with respect to log of u squared, that term, it disappears. All your job is yes. gone. Nobody will appreciate it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so my point is that if I can always, when I said mu squared, I, I, there's some confusion here, I think that we should. I no, no, but I now. understand this is what you're saying. Yes. Anytime you have a, a, a variation in q squared, all your formalism will be affected. But you should tell this extra term, how is it affected? Mm -hmm. How? You should tell. Either you put right. outside on top of it mm -hmm. as a, an extra term, or you should design a, in a tricky way so that when you take the derivative that you the dog, it does not disappear. It stays as a plus. So it's like a, okay. it's like more a, a formal way to add it. All outside the square bracket, or you add it in with the log so that when you take the transition, you still stay there. Okay, let's, I think, can I keep going? Yeah, why don't we be yeah. a team? I think we yeah. agree to yeah. disagree on this issue. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm going to keep insisting that I can do that. I can set uh, u squared equal to q squared and differentiate. We're going to keep disagreeing. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, so that's, if, once you have a, a, a D-lab set up with this correction, then the rest is trivial. Right. You just put it in. Uh, into a pseudocop, you can you can then simulate the whole jets and they all get they get modified by this Q lab term. That is true when virtuality is large. When virtuality comes down to the saturation scale, again, this should be Q squared uh, times Q hat tau. When virtuality comes down to Q hat tau, then of course you are it's no longer accurate to do single scattering. You have to have many 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 scatterings uh, that you have to make uh, to consider. And this is the standard PDMPS regime. Um, so now what happens is over, if you, if you consider what the lifetime of a parton is, which is about lambda squared Q squared, the lifetime is, a, is, is quite long. And so over that lifetime, it can have many, many, many scatterings. And this is now simulated using, not using DGLAB, but by using a rate equation, where you basically calculate what is the probability of an, em of an emission being stimulated by having many, many, many scatterings. So you follow the probability until that gets up to one, then you have an emission, and then you start the whole process again. And so this is model, again, two acronyms, there's LBT and Martini, and these are the, the two uh, uh, event generators that model this kind of, of, uh, of uh, physics. And I, I, again, I expected Al and Edmond to talk about this stuff, and so uh, I didn't make any more slides on this. They're on their way. Okay, so this in this case, of course, the energy is still very large, but the virtuality is, has come down to the medium scale. You can also have partons where both the energy and the virtuality have both come down. Uh, so these are basically strongly interacting partons in the medium. So most of these end up being absorbed by a medium. You cannot describe them with PQCD. They have to be modeled again. Uh, the scale of the parton is more or less the same as the scale of the medium. And can use ADS-CFT, and I'll show uh, some simulations using that. I don't know why it flickers like this. Um, there are a bunch of people who worked on how to do this, but the, the, the calculations that we are using are, are from the people on the bottom line. So this is what we call the hybrid model, where they take a full va developed vacuum shower and they drag down each of the partons. Okay, so this is our picture now. We have uh, a, sh uh, a shower that is in the vacuum. Um, you have some portion of this which way where there are many, many, many emissions and the occasional scattering, which I'm saying I'm trying to resum into the DGLAB equation. There's a region where you have many, many, many scatterings and, and few emissions, which is the DDMPS regime. And there is some tricky transition between these two regions, which we have no idea how to simulate. Uh, Outside, you can have uh, uh, soft radiations uh, where both the energy is small and the virtuality is low, and these are strongly interacting with the medium. Of course, this is the picture in a static brick. If you put this in a, in a QGP, in a quark gluon plasma, which is now evolving as the jet is going through the medium, then this, this um, uh, uh, barrier between these two also begins to move. Okay, so that's also that's something that has to be simulated. I'm going to skip this in the interest of time and just move on to the next thing, which is that 
uh, after that, if you want to simulate what happened to all those partners that went into the medium, uh, if, you, if, you, if you simulate the medium with a hydrodynamic simulation, what happens is this deposits energy at the, in the medium, and this energy part of it flows with the jet. Okay? And so you have these wakes that are, that are generated in the medium. Some part of that will be captured back when you, when you, when you try to cluster jets. Okay, and so the, besides things like Q hat, and I don't know if some people are familiar with these other coefficients like E hat, E hat is like the drag per unit length. Q hat is a transverse broadening, E hat is a drag, and you can think of higher moments. There are also other uh, uh, transport coefficients in the medium, which is if you deposit energy, you know, the jet is like a delta function in the medium. If you deposit energy, uh, like a delta function, and that expands. And, and how does this expand and become a source in the hydrodynamic simulation? That's another transport coefficient we don't know. But this is how we currently model it. This is, again, this is entirely a model. So you have a hard part on that's a jet going through, and that has a scattering with some object in the medium. Okay, this has some part on. You sample a part on from the, from, from the medium. That's by sampling a Boltzmann distribution. And this scatters and goes off. And you, this now becomes a part of the jet shower, and it leaves a hole in the medium, which you also track. Okay. And then this guy can again have other scatterings, can have emissions, and every time it scatters, it generates another part on, which becomes part of the jet shower, and another hole that you have to keep track of. So you basically consider all of these part ons, uh, the ones that are solid lines are part of the jet, and the dashed lines are things that are sort of holes in the medium that you have to subtract. Other methods you can think about, and you will see all of these simulated again. You can think of constant broadening, that each and every one of these partons gets the same amount of transverse kicks. Right? So even soft partons get very large transverse kicks, and hard partons or sorry, get, get the same transverse kick, which means for a soft parton, that could be a large change in the angle. Uh, this is something we put into our simulation just to see uh, you know, that we could rule something out because this is obviously not right. The, the amount of kick you receive should have something to do with the energy of the parton. Uh, another thing we also simulated is how to do ADS-CFT drag, which I just talked about, whereas you take all these partons in the shower and each of them has a string attached to it, which basically drags it back. So all of this together now, uh, you also now have to consider how to hadronize any of these partons in the uh, one, once it comes out of the medium. Hadronization includes hadronization of partons that escape the medium, which is what we were talking about. And hadronization of the medium, right, which is excited behind the parton, which is not, which is obviously breaks uh, this kind of thing. So, and also you need a mechanism for doing hadronization where you can go from proton proton collisions to heavy ion collisions smoothly. Okay. It has to be the exact same formalism so that when you, you take the heavy ion collision and you roll it down, make it small, you know, make it more and more peripheral, it should go back to, a, to the same thing as a PP collision. So, what we do is if you take a jet shower, so here is a Two colliding beams, and I'm not specifying whether this is proton proton or gold gold, it doesn't matter. You have a parton shower that comes out that branches. If you know the color of this parton, if you track it, you add another fake parton which carries the anti color of this object, and then you and you send it down the beam line and you attach a string to it. And that string breaks and makes hadrons. Why does it have to go down the beam? It's fake. I'm adding energy momentum to it. You don't want to catch it in your detector. But eventually the string will fragment and you will lose some. Yeah, so what happens is so in, 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 in Pythia, right? This almost the same string exists. It exists between the quark or gluon and a dike quark or some other object in the proton. So that's how the string connects. So it's not even the back of the string. So in back to back jets, just one jet attaches to one beam line, the other jet attaches to the and one string. One string, yeah. They don't attach it. No. One, one. In E plus E minus, they do attach that. Right. Yeah, in PP, that's, this is how it happens. 
because it's the, the, the anti color of the quark. It's not a color singlet, right? No, I understand. Back to back is not a color singlet. Yeah. Most but, of them. Most of them. <laughs> so the whole problem becomes of set, set, setting out and finding a color singlet, and there are two ways of doing it. One is you keep the track of the color of every part on your simulation, or you let go of that and you assign colors by hand, randomly, assuming that all the colors have been rotated if you went through the plasma. So these are called the colored or colorless combinations. Okay. Uh, so I, we have been look. These are all the different observables that you can look at. So you can look at hadron RAA, B two, uh, IAA, gamma hadrons, near side IAA, and up to here everything. You can argue that you're looking at leading hadrons. It's this kind of a formalism where the quark or gluon cleanly gets out of the medium, then fragments outside if you have high enough momentum. The moment you start talking about jets, some part of the jet is going to be outside leading hadron kind of thing. It has to have uh, interaction with the medium. It has to have um, uh, some part of it would be medium excited as a wake. There'll be hadronization and in inside, inside part of the medium. And so all of these jet observables get affected by that. And of course, then if you go to things like, that's why the colors won't work also. Uh, if you look at things like jet and medium correlations, you look at a jet going in one direction, look at the excitation of the medium at say, uh, some large angle away from it, that's entirely driven by, uh, uh, by the other transport conditions. Okay, so you need a, Monte Carlo framework to address all of these things, uh, all the you know, having multiple theories, uh, starting from high Q squared to an high energy series to low Q squared high energy to low energy low Q squared theories times excitations in the medium. You need to address something that gives you all the different transport coefficients, and you want to whatever you do, you want to address all of the different observables simultaneously, and I. For AA collisions, that framework is called the Jetski framework. And there's a, you can download this little shameless uh, uh, advertisement for, for Jetski. Uh, you can go here, download the, the event generator. And the fun thing about this event generator is, sorry, is that you can now go in and, and work on only one part of the theory, ignore everything else, just change one of the modules, and everything else will run. And you can see what the effect of your change was in the entire story of the collision. So last, let me just sh show you now some, some, some actual results. What would happen if you ignored this kind of multi-scale physics and just used you know, one theory across the entire energy range? So here's examples from just the LBT, but applied to the entire evolution of the jet. Could you remind us what LBT is? LBT is, is like this. Uh, the, go back fast enough. No. <laughs> yeah. BDMPS. BDMPS. Think about that. What does LBT stand for? Yeah. Linear Boltzmann transport. Linear Boltzmann transport. Don't ask me what Martini stands for. Yeah, I just want to get those acronyms out of the way. So, so the matter means the, the stuff we've been discussing all this time, and Martini is when you have a rate equation, and the same is with LBT, it's also a, a rate equation for multiple scattering. Uh, so if you did that. So this is for single uh, RAA for single hadrons, leading hadrons, and this is the RAA for jets. It looks pretty good, except we realize that this uses one alpha s coupling in the medium, and this is using a, an alpha s, which is quite different from that, 25% difference in alpha s. The same thing happens if you take matter, which is what we were talking about, which is the uh, high virtuality, few scattering part of the, 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 the jet shower. If you try to fit the, the leading hadrons, then you over suppress the, the jets. This is the this is like an angularity. This is the jet shape. We'll talk about this in a 
second. Um, this is using uh, the hybrid model. Uh, again, it does not seem to get this kind of quality, even qualitatively, it does not seem to get the jet shape uh, going in. All of these are applying only one model at a time. So, um, this is what we are doing in Jetscape is we are taking all of these different models of energy loss and applying them part on by part on depending upon the parameters of the given problem. If the energy and virtuality is large, you apply in medium deep level. If the energy has, if the virtuality has come down, then you apply uh, EDMTS. If the, if the energy and virtuality have both come down, you apply it to the SCM. Okay. Then you could go in, download this, and just change any one of these objects that you would want to change. You know, comes with the standard hydro simulation. All of these things happen automatically. How does this work? So let's look at how matter works for um, starting out in PP, because you want everything is done. You know, you look at anything in heavy ion collisions, you divide by the, the resultant PP collisions. So how does that work for PP? Um, this is the jet cross section. Uh, we actually do better than Pythia uh, on, on, on PP. This is the, the cross section of jets with R of 0.3 and I think R of 0.4, or maybe the other way around. Uh, theory divided by data. This is the die jet the away side distribution of the jet energy. So you look at a jet in one direction, look at a jet in the other direction, and you look at the distribution uh, in, in the jet, the away side jet momentum divided by the leading jet momentum, which is xj. Again, the black points are data and the red points are from our simulator. And now, uh, the thing that I was talking about that uh, results for single hadron suppression, leading hadron suppression, and jet suppression within one formant, which in this case has matter and MVT. So it has a high virtuality shower, which is medium modified, and it has a low virtuality multiple scattering shower on a hydro using the, the hadronization that I just talked about. And you can get both of these now with a single coupling with P, which previously was hard. So what can you do with that? This is jets, this is leading hadrons. So in both cases, the black points are the data and the red and the magenta are our, our simulation. V2, uh, 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 assumes a, a symmetry of leading hadrons and of jets. Um, you, again, another illustration of what would happen if you only used one formalism and not the multi-scale approach. That's this green line. So it, it doesn't have this rise with the data, which the Jetscape thing does. Now, it doesn't come completely on top of the data, and that's because we're not doing the hydro event by event. That takes an enormous amount of time. But it's been well established now that adding, doing event by event hydro tends to push these up by 5 to 10%. So we're hopeful this will work out as well. Event shapes. So looking inside the jet, and uh, looking in angular bins uh, inside the jet and seeing how much energy is in each of these angular bins. This is the, the, how the PP does. So you see that the red line is, from, is our event generator and the blue dashed line is Pythia. And we see the, the Pythia and, our, and, and, and Jetscape are right on top of each other and neither of them is on top of the data. <laughs> so you're off by about 30%. In, in the PP, and this is still a problem that is not yet solved. Um, if you wanted to go forward and see, well, what does it do if I did event shapes in lead lead or in heavy ion collision divided by PP, and now you have all the different models that I talked about, the matter in LBT, matter with ADS-CFT, and the matter with broadening, which is just adding the same broadening everywhere, which we know is a wrong theory, and so it completely fails. But the matter plus LBT seems to have the same structure, where you know, it has an enhancement at small radius, uh, a depletion at intermediate radii, and again, an enhancement at larger radius. It doesn't. The fun thing is, if we had done just the lead lead calculation and compared with the lead lead data, our line would be exactly on top of the data. The reason it's not on top of the data is because you're dividing by PP and you're off in the PP. 
Okay, so that's because the PP is higher when you divide by PP, this side comes out lower. So if you just read PP to go through the data, then you just give the data in PP and divide by that, saying this will work out, yeah, this will work. Yeah. You have to check that. Yeah, this is just a tuning issue, but then the question is, I, you know, you want to do it physically understand why both Pythia and us don't get the, the angular distribution at large angles. Okay, uh, I think I made that point already, yes. Oh, and then of course also the fragmentation function. Uh, this is the, the Z fraction carried by, parton, by by hadrons inside a reconstructed jet. The black points are the data and all the different combinations of series that I mentioned. Uh, again, you see this, this the, the, the red line matter plus LBT seems to get most of the qualitative behavior except for this one last point. So I would say that the outcome of doing this kind of phenomenology and event generation is that you get a good description of most of the data. There are minor discrepancies in PP, which need better tuning. There are still discrepancies in AA, which where you need some better phenomenology. It's possible that our modeling of medium response needs to be more sophisticated. So we are basically doing this part on by part on. It's not, it may be that you really have to do a kind of hydrodynamic response and then try to use, put that into the jet and then see if that gives us this, um, this enhancement here, or maybe the enhancement here has some effect as well. Uh, plane broadening doesn't seem to work. Uh, you really need a kind of this, this kind of recoil mechanism where you pick up a pattern from the medium. And so the next question you want to ask is how sensitive is it to the, to the recoil pattern? How important is it that that pattern have a thermal distribution? Currently, it's only been done for a thermal distribution, but I think that's something we are checking right now that if you change that distribution to something else, would it still work? So this is, so you have some part of it which is like pure theory, but then it's surrounded by in, in this envelope phenomenology and event generation. And you need that to be able to get all of this data simultaneously. Okay. And now, so um, the, this is like in those adventure movies where the credits have rolled out, and then they're telling you about the, the next episode that's coming up. <laughs> this is the EA dedicated, dedicated program. Yes. <laughs> you got to say something. Something on the EA. So the, the problems are, if you wanted to take this and go off to the EA, the problems are you don't have any hadronic energy loss. There's no way to do that yet. No clear way to do that. There's no hadronic response. That is, if you have some hadrons or hadrons from the jet that deposit into the hadronic part or deposit into a, into a nucleus, how does it excite uh, modes in that? Uh, no hadronization in a hadronic medium. There's no simulation of the event activity. That's a whole other discussion that we talk about. Well, there's TMD PDFs, GPDs, spin dependent objects, none of these are simulated currently. And all of this matters. So, just to give you an idea, if you, if you go back to, to Hermes data, which is the previous EA uh, experiment, and if you look at just the leading hadron suppression, same theory that I just talked about here, uh, but just slightly different phenomenology. One uses a vacuum fragmentation function that is involved with the thing we just talked about. Um, for different nuclei, if you follow the blue line. And that gives you a Q hat of about 0.08 GeV squared. It's about a factor of 10, 20 smaller than what it is in, in, in heavy ion collisions. So how do you get the Q hat of GeV squared? The fragmentation function is factor. Oh, in input, see. the input fragmentation is vacuum, but then I evolve it up to the medium modified thing. And then you say, okay, what are the predictions for the energy dependence? Pretty good. Energy predictions for Q squared dependence. All of these are without any kind of, uh, it's only one parameter, which is Q hat that is fit. Now the same thing is done again by, by my collaborator, Shin Yang Wang, and he looks at the same data, but in his case, his initial fragmentation function is modified to include some medium and if you look at his Q hat, it's a factor of four smaller than that. So what you extract, even though the theory is the same, the envelopes are different, the phenomenology is different, the extracted parameters turn out to be different. 
even in simple analysis. So if you if you want to do a, a, a full thorough extraction of properties of a medium or of hybridization in an EA collision, you need a sophisticated collection. <laughs> All right, so we will not take out the room yet. Any questions? Uh, just a little comment. If you look at the formula we were discussing, it should be very different. No, it's not. No, no, it's not. That QF times pound should be. Inside of P, Y plus of QF pound, parenthesis, which multiplies of P. It is. It is a modification of the kernel, not a, a modification. It is. Bracket, bracket. No, you should, you should do P, Y plus QF. No. P, Y, the kernel. You are modifying the kernel. No, Q doesn't have a lot of Q problem. That's the problem. That's the problem. Well, yeah, I agree. That's the problem. He has to. He's modifying the kernel, so you have to have capital P Y plus Q F pound, which multiplies the square bracket. Then everything is. Then your. Oh, well, I, I think you I see this expression. expression I, I don't. Time? I don't have. I don't have any problem with this P of Y being characterized precisely the way this because have a B of Y Y, but what that tells you is that you have a fork that fragments into a fork and a new one. Yes, and even with the medium. Basically, still have the, the, the structure of that vertex is going to be the same. Yes. So I think you can still factorize P of it's the same P of Y yeah. that you can show this. So you can factorize it like this. The, the question is whether you should include it, whether it influences the Diglat evolution or not. And that's, I think, is the one. We disagree to disagree on that. But yeah. that's, that's the thing. This thing squared is more like very loosely Q bar Q, right? Operator. And if you square this, you have Q bar Q over. Two f plus i is included. So if you're thinking of writing operators, this is a different twist operator. Yeah. But I use it and, and therefore plus i might come from the x state in your brackets. Yeah, yeah. but some other no, it comes from the medium. Yeah. 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 So that that's, that's the weird that's part. That's, no, that's, yeah, so, so that's the weird part. But the p, the fact that the, it's the p of p of y, the functional form of p of y, it just depends on the fact that you have a fork. Emitting a blue one, and this is and this first emission vertex is the same. <laughs> so, so I would remind people, all the, uh, people who are as old as me and and go oh, beyond. There was a, a Miller Chu or JLR equation, right? Z D log one over x, D D log Q squared. So L is not here yet. I think it was for x G. So there is a linear term, of course. Uh, all right, maybe I'm off by some twos and pies. And then um, there is a, oh, don't ask me. So I'll, I'll take a page from a digit, I'll write the pound here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, there is uh, probably at least an alpha square and some color factor and, and something depending on the R. R squared is a radius uh, R is the radius of the proton or nucleus to make it dimensionless. So they wrote an equation like this, right? And then if you write it as, as Digla, right? So think of it as evolution in Q squared. This is non logarithmic in Q squared, right? And you usually, you, strictly speaking, you say, well, what is this xg squared? Really, it wasn't, it was an approximation for some 4 p one operator, whereas, you know, xg was called a 2 p one operator. So it's the same thing as here. Right, so this is really a hard twist object, so you shouldn't enter, right? This one with Q squared is not going to give you a log Q squared. Right? Q squared. So, so it's, so it's so uh, part. <laughs> <laughs> this is the part I don't get. Why do you insist on this being a constant? I insist on. I mean, not having a one. What happens if there's a one? So you need to get the log. So, so what? I think so. Purists uh, and maybe. Here's the right in this case, you would say that you should write a separate diglab for your two. So G2, you write D D log squared. And and you could do the and you could do that? Equal and, to and sum. Well yes. let's write very loosely, yes. right? And then you have another 
evolution equation for your G4 or, or maybe what? Yes. Say this operator and, is and they could mix with each other. F P uh, tilde right. G four no and, and that's so that's know, exactly that's what Müller two is, right? It's mixing yes. you're mixing you know, this is now influencing this object. But it's more like because it's an X evolution this was about. Uh, about G4 was a well genuine power, but also was a kinematic power, which then does not separate from G4. Yeah, that's not no the fact is that D or D double X amount of mixing. Right? No, then. Hmm? D or D log one over X. So it's an evolution. Yes, yeah, so if you see, right, so that's what I'm saying. It's not what it's not it's not what 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 it's not yeah, but this is also the Charles B. This is exactly the same. This is a fragmentation, but structure function, and so is this. Right? They're both of the same on both of the in in state distribution. No, no, no. So in this case, one is incoming, one is outgoing. Right? You're, you're taking an incoming PDF, but this is an outgoing fragmentation function. Whereas in this case, both are of the same type. They're both outgoing. Or both incoming. Both incoming. Both incoming. Yes. yes. No, I understand that's not exactly the same story. Yes. But I think there is no. I think in that case, there is, you can make the twist argument that they are both on the incoming state, right? There is no operator mixing, but then, or unless you have this X thing. I don't see how you can stop that. Or it's not going to be. Well, I mean, if you're going to apply a twist correction, it will have two kinds of ways of thinking: you know, Dicon Corinthian polarization or covariant Corinthian polarization. In one case, you have trouble disentangling what is just, uh, let's say, free body contribution, which is just a uh, counterterm to make a gauge invariance, which is two contribution, or you have Corinthian covariant Corinthian polarization, in which you are using a tight way of making. Uh, in that case, it's easy to dis distinguish which one is G2, which one is G4, and then the evolution equations have to help. So, one using the current collinear factorization, probably what you're calling G4 now is kind of part of a gauge link part of G2. Depends if you're considering gauge links or not. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yes, yeah, so, so here I guess this is uh, yeah, what the gauge link is. So, maybe it's part of the gauge link. So that's only really part of the contribution, you have to separate it. But so you're saying in that case they would mix like, like this? It might. Maybe if this is just taken from the gauge link in this QQ bar of operators, maybe that would mix. Uh, but I don't know. I think that's important. Okay, how about. I had a question on a different topic. Okay, why don't we table this for now? <laughs> uh, I, I think we'll, we'll have a. So, you know, how about at 2 30? The organizers will be there with the cookies. Whoever wants to join us is welcome. If a vision joins us, we'll <laughs> 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 continue the discussion about. Uh, new square, uh, okay, so. Yes, so, so, so my question concerns the what you mentioned the difficulty in the transition between the yeah. called meta regime. Mm -hmm. So, here this is still this is also so, one scattering. Okay, this is we never go past that because that's you know, because only up to one scattering can I write an equation that makes sense. So, and then so, so we give this, but this but I, mean, the, I mean, the formula you presented the diagrams, yes, so, yeah, we're like a billion. Group. Yes, right. So, but I, I cannot write a, I cannot write a exact equation for that. Right. So, it's, so, 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 so your problem in interpolating this with this all your ordering variable changes, or, or what is your? I mean, I mean, what I'm trying to ask is like, what is the calculation one would have to do to actually calculate the PF as the as the wide plot? What is the what is the Oh, how do you get the transition, transition going? going? Yes, yes. One more. One so he's one saying that. So, here, so this this is only one scattering for it. Yes. Yeah. Or no scatter, right? So you have just how to do all of this. Yeah. Well, yes. no, no, no. The question no. is how to transition. How to from transition this from this to this, uh, right? Yeah, that's what you have. Right. 
Yeah, so I think that that pro you probably have to do double emission calculation, right? To see because so, so, the two so, things happen. One is that these emissions are no longer angular; they're just separated in time, right? There's one emission, and after a long time, there's another emission. Whereas in DLAP, they're all angle ordered, right? So somehow that ordering is broken down as you go from that phase to this phase. But there's still all the information time, right? You just be in yeah, production so, time. Yeah. So, so, yeah. So, so, so what is it that prevents you from taking BD and DS and going to the hard, going to the appropriate kinematical limit and recovering what you were doing in the first step? What is it that's there that's missing in the BD and DS? Ah, so, so what's missing what, what is. Include? Yes, very good question. So what's missing is, is things like this in PDMPS where the first line can be off time like So it's a question of having a time, time like off shell incoming yes. Yes. hardcore. Yes. So, these are the not so, so if yes. you were able to do the BDMPS calculation with finite cube squared, then in principle this would expand the, the would whole cover everything. Thing. Is that what, what you're saying? I, he mentioned he wants to write it as deep lab. I don't know why. Wants to write it as an evolution of two squares. Yeah, but let's get it. If we're not going to go that way, we don't know how to do that. So if you do BDMPS with a time like in a time like virtual incoming parton, then from that you should be able to be the appropriate kinematical limit to, to get this two. So you would have that. Both. That wouldn't be BDMPS anymore, but yes. If I could yeah, it's like a different version of BDMPS <laughs> to a if I can if I can derive everything I can see with yes, that's fine. <laughs> So, but all of these make some kind of approximation, right? So in this case, the approximation was that this is much larger than k one. Okay. And then you have some expressions that you can deal with, and then it then it actually looks like it can. I mean, I understand the arguments that are being presented, and we can have this longer discussion, but at least it, here I can write it in this form. Okay. But the, if I have multiple scattering, right, there is no ordering. See, in DLAP, the other thing you do is that you assume that like, this guy is very virtual compared to these right? You don't make that assumption in DLAP. Like, so all the, the same. ordering is information time, right? I mean, this is why you assume this, right? Information time goes I, I would turn, no, it's the same. I would turn it around and say that because the virtuality is large and you're peaking, and the large logarithmic correction is really when you when you TK into two things which are very, very on shot on shot compared to the parent. Right? As long as you can keep doing that, you have deep lab. But in BDMPS, this guy's virtuality is pretty much the same as this guy's virtuality. It's pretty much the same. Yeah, sure. So that's, that's a completely different regime. And how do you track? I don't know. But so are you saying if you go back to this controversial slide, we'll speak in <laughs> Sorry, no, let me do it again. Yeah. If you want to include multiple scatterings, do you expect as high powers of QPAT bound? Or with some coefficients, of course, appearing in the structure, is there some conceptual issue to go beyond one scattering? For one emission, that's what it would be. One emission, but also one exchange, right? If you have no, no, no. Change, yeah, many, many. So for many, many, many exchanges, you can, you will have more and more and more. And so what happens in BDMPS, right. by the way, what happens in BDMPS is they completely ignore this part. Right? Well, they can be small like. No. Because they're saying that this has no no rules. The vacuum has no effect on this, right? It's it's completely dominated by the series here. Right? The multiple scattering induced right. emission is right. much, much larger. So there is some overlaps. Without this. Right. Without the yes. without the vacuum term. So they just ignore the vacuum term. There's no vacuum term. Right? In a BD, a BDMPS quark, if it entered a medium where it did not scatter, it would not emit. Right, it's in the one of the types. So it's a subtracting vacuum. Yes. So, so, then, so that is basically, right now, right? this is taking this part and, and just sit, imagine this is not there. So you take this and I'm all other higher powers of this and we sum that. Right, but, but, but why you sum with the same kernel? That's what I was talking about. Not you sum with this kernel. Not with the same kernel. Why you multiply by the same P1? Same P2 function. That's how it comes out. Way. That's how it comes out. I, I don't, I'm not doing it by hand. Yeah. But yeah. bottom line is multiple air scatterings, of course, will come in as high powers of the yes. yes. I thought that was the question, right? That was how to go to that other. Sure. That's part of No, no, no. Yeah, I think part of the thing is that the hedge tech depends on Hughes. But the point is that. <laughs> hashtag, hashtag, okay. But if you, if, you, if, you, if you kept all of these examples, Yuri, the problem is, Yuri, the problem is that you, you can do this for single emission. Okay? 
Yeah. And you can do that for multiple emissions. If you ignore all of this, only keep this, you can do multiple emissions. Oh, skip. Emissions. I've already done some multiple Oh, oh you're just solving your evolution equations. Yes. Right? Yeah, but that's then that's a question. Right? So I can I can do multiple emissions in the really limit wonderful. where this is large and this is small, or I can do multiple emissions when this is large and this is small. Yes. I can't do it when they're of the same size. Right. I think if I remember again, L, L, and L are not here, but um, um, Gene also worked on it. It's something about the Dion has to grab the medium to generate double loads in the sun. And, um, that's just a bit, so they have this double log limit where they want to look at, right? Yeah. I, that's that's fine, but I but that's a medium contribution in some sense. But look, I'm not qualified to start a <laughs> discussion on that. I'm not sure there's enough people in the room to talk enough about that. I don't know. I have to wait for how yeah. to get there. Yeah, we can actually have a discussion tomorrow. Basically, <laughs> 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 I'm fine with either. Okay, any other questions? If not, let's thank a bit. <laughs> so, lots of you who guys got here, the procedure is in about five to ten minutes. We gather in front of the elevators, spontaneously form groups that go out for lunch if you interest in lunch. It doesn't have to be one big group, in fact, it's actually recommended not to go together. <laughs> Okay. Hi. Hi. I got your email. Yeah. <laughs>